Welcome to Emmanuel Church Glenhaven Bible Talks. Our church loves to engage with God's written word, the Bible, as we gather week by week. If you missed a sermon or want to hear it again, we pray that your time here today will refresh and renew you as you follow Jesus. Today we continue our series of sermons called Holiness and the Heart of God, Studies in the Ten Commandments. We value our reputation or good name. Some people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to defend their reputations and clear their name if they believe they've been slandered. The book of Proverbs declares, A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. In this talk, Paul Gagens takes us to the third commandment. Don't misuse God's name. Paul shows there's a lot more to this command than not using God's name as a swear word. God's name is all about his reputation, and God values his good name. Paul encourages us to consider how our whole lives can show that we too value God's good name. But before we hear from Paul, let's listen to the Bible. The passages are Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 7, and Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. From Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. From Colossians chapter 3. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now... Here's Paul. Well, the Olympics have only been going for a couple of days, but already we've seen our fair share of controversy and scandal. Uh, even before the opening ceremony, uh, you may have heard the captain of the Japanese gymnastics team was sent home. Do you know why she was sent home? She broke team policy. Uh, she was caught smoking. Uh, and so she was sent home before the Olympics even began. Uh, it gets worse because a British equestrian champion was also removed from her team as evidence came to light about her mistreating a horse. And then some team officials from Canada were given their marching orders and they've been sent home because they were filming an opposing team's training session using a drone. In case you think Australians are beyond this, an Australian swimming coach was reprimanded as well for supporting a Korean swimmer on television. 
Now, they're all different cases. Uh, they have different severity, I suppose, that you might have an opinion on. But they all have something in common. You see, it's a problem with the team that they're representing. Uh, in the Olympics, you represent your country. And so your words and your actions are deemed to reflect on your nation as a whole. And as heard in the comments regarding the Australian coach, in one of the worst allegations you can make some against someone in this position, they were called, and I quote, un-Australian. Well, the same reasoning lies behind the third commandment. Uh, rather than being merely a prohibition against using God's name as a swear word, and although that is certainly one application which we'll come to, what's at stake here is the name of the Lord. And by which we mean the character and the reputation of the Lord. Because as God's people, we have the opportunity both to uplift and celebrate and glorify the name of the Lord, but we can also diminish and empty and damage the name of the Lord. It relates to how we speak of God, but also our actions and practices as we reflect God's image, as we are His representatives to the world. Now, why is this such a big deal? How did this even make the top 10? You might be asking such questions. Well, the commandments were given to Israel after they were rescued from slavery in Egypt. They are meant to represent God and His love and His rescue of them. And we've seen in the first two commandments that Israel were to place God as number one, to place nothing above God, but also not to replace God with any idols that would steal away their thoughts and words and actions. And this is good news as they uh, escape from the false gods of Egypt, uh, from the false power of Pharaoh to be reminded whose name they worship. The one who is the creator, the one who is the rescuer, in fact, the only one who deserves their praise and obedience. And the third commandment now brings together this personal name of God, this character and reputation of God and the need to uphold His character and reputation. Now, the personal name of God is first revealed to Moses through the burning bush in Exodus 3. You might know that story. It is given once again in Exodus 34, when God, in fact, gives these commandments for the second time. And so, the Lord comes down in the cloud and stands with Moses and proclaims His name, the Lord. Now, you may note, just like in Exodus 3, that God uses His revealed name. Uh, literally, it's the word I am in English, or in Hebrew, uh, Yahweh or Jehovah. And here, as it is six or 7,000 times in the Old Testament, you'll see it appear in capital letters, Lord, L-O-R-D. Every time that that word appears in those capital letters, it's not telling us to shout it out. It's telling us that this represents the name I am, the revealed name of God. God not as a distant, impersonal being, but as someone that can be known, the creator, the sustainer, the rescuer of his people. And so, as he passes in front of Moses, he proclaims these words. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. The power of God's name is not a superstitious or magical force, like they're calling on one of the names of the gods of Egypt, or like they're calling out a special word, abracadabra or shazam or something like that, any more than we like to have our selfish prayers answered as if we pray to God and use His special name that He will become like a good luck charm or even a vending machine for us. No, His name is powerful, but because He is powerful, 
not to do our will, but to express his very nature. And his nature is to create and to love and to save. And so when Paul writes to the Romans in the New Testament, he actually is quoting Isaiah here in Romans 10. It gives us the right expression of this power to rescue people, even from sin and evil. And he says this, For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So when we speak of God, we're calling to mind all that he is. That he is our creator, our rescuer, our forgiver. And Israel, like Moses here in Exodus 34, are to respond with a, a sense of reverent fear because he's, he's also the judge. And he will forgive those who call to him in their hearts, who will call on the name of the Lord. But he will also not stand for those who rebel against him, for those who reject him as creator and sustainer and rescuer and forgiver. So what's the proper response for hearing God's name? Well, Moses gets it right here in, in Exodus 34, verse 8 and 9, and Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found favour in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. Moses physically worships God, but he also calls to mind the, the goodness and power and forgiveness of the Lord and recognises that he hasn't always honoured his name. And so he falls before him and asks for his mercy and forgiveness. He calls on his, not just his creating nature, but his forgiving and merciful nature. He brings honour to the name of the Lord. Now, these are the sort of broad dimensions of God's name, but what's the third commandment actually warning us against? And so we read in Exodus 20, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses His name. Now, the personal name of God, remember, encapsulating His whole character and reputation, but the command is not to misuse this name. Or in the older version, you may be familiar with it, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, there are two things going on here. Uh, one is there's an action. It's a word to do with lifting up or carrying or bearing something. But it's carrying it in a particular direction. And so the second part that's often used towards things is that they are worthless or corrupt. And so to use God's name in vain or to misuse it here is to carry his name or to lift it up towards worthlessness. <laughs> in other words, to make it empty. To treat God like he has no power. To do the very opposite of what we just prayed in the Lord's Prayer where we say, hallowed be your name, rather than honouring it and bringing glory to it. It's to remove his name of its power and importance. It's dragging his reputation or name in the mud. You may remember recently those terrible stabbings in Bondi Junction. On the night the news broke, some false reports came out naming this person as the perpetrator. He was named on TV. The problem was it wasn't him and so, rightly, this man brought a defamation suit against the network for associating him with something that he didn't do. And we hear lots about defamation, of course, at the moment. But this is kind of a pretty open and shut case, isn't it? He was associated with something terrible that he had nothing to do with. Israel were guilty of breaking this commandment by associating God with things that were not his character. For example, they brought false oaths or promises in God's name which made him appear 
as dishonest and weak because they didn't fulfill their promises. They expressed false prophecies and said, God said this, which he didn't say. And yet it's not just in those specific cases. Rather, their whole lives were meant to reflect the image and goodness of God because they were meant to represent God. Now come with me uh, now to Isaiah 48. Here's an example where judgment is called on Israel for their stubborn hearts. And we read this. Listen to this, you descendants of Jacob, you who are called by the name of Israel and come from the line of Judah, you who take oaths in the name of the Lord and invoke the God of Israel, but not in truth or righteousness. You who call yourselves citizens of the holy city and claim to rely on the God of Israel, The Lord Almighty is his name. They're meant to be God's people. They claim to rely on God. They do certain things in God's name. They take oaths in God's name. They claim the blessings of God. And yet they don't do it here in truth and righteousness. In other words, they do it hypocritically. Their worship is insincere. And despite their sin, God promises to refine them and forgive them. But he does that not because they've responded properly. And in fact, he does it not for their reputation, but for his reputation, for his name. And so in verse 11, we read these words. For my own sake, for my own sake I do this. How can I let myself be defamed? I will not yield my glory to another. God is the creator, God is the rescuer and yet so often his people brought him shame and essentially stole his glory, essentially emptied his name of that power. And so rightfully when we apply this command, we apply it both to the ways we speak of God and so we should not use his holy name as a swear word or say things like oh my God or Jesus in the wrong context or even their abbreviations OMG and you know all the things and if this is part of your language it's a good reminder today just to stop but actually underneath all this is is all our words all our actions should be honorable to God because he is the one who created us and called us back to him we don't make fun of his name And we're careful with the name of Jesus because he is the one who deserves praise and honour and glory and worship. You may be familiar with the term dupe or a different version of it, a cheap knockoff, that kind of thing. It stands for duplicate and refers to a product or a copy of something that's very expensive So you get this really expensive perfume and you think, well, that's too expensive, but I'll just duck down to the chemist and I'll buy a really cheap version of the same thing. It kind of looks the same and smells-ish the same. Much cheaper. Usually it's applied to makeup or fashion items or handbags and sunglasses. Essentially, they're cheap knockoffs. They're fakes or replicas using different names. Now, the problem for the expensive brands is they've They're meant to be the original and the best and the best quality and others are chiming in to make money from their designs. Israel were being a pretty poor imitation of their holy God. Perhaps it's because they didn't take him too seriously. Perhaps they'd merely adapted him to who they thought he should be. Here's my version of God, rather than the original, rather than he, how he has revealed himself to be. And it's so easy for us to do the same thing, to create our own version of God or our own version of Jesus. And we see this when we make our own decisions about the way God should be, what God should think, what we think is right and wrong rather than what God is like and how he's presented in his word and through his son Jesus. 
So let us today be reminded of the one whose name we bear. Last week, there was a whole bunch of videos from the Australian athletes unboxing their uniforms in Paris, and despite some less than positive comments about the quality of the fashion, one thing was clear. All of the athletes represent the name of Australia. They are all bearers of that name. Israel's problem is they forgot who they were representing and what God was like. And as New Testament believers, we bear a different name, the name of Jesus. Uh, You may or may not know that my middle name is Christopher. Uh, The literal meaning of this name is bearer of Christ. The Greek elements, Christo, Christ, and Pharaoh, to bear or to carry. And so, Christopher, to bear Christ. But I'm actually not the only Christopher in the room. Do you know that? There's more than one. In fact, if you are a follower of Jesus, you are a Christopher. You are a bearer of Christ's name. Or to use another name, the name Christian. It's not just a title. It's not just a tag that means, oh, you must be from Europe European background or something like that, or, or you tick Christian on the census box. But in fact, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've decided that Jesus is your Lord, that He is your rescuer, that He is your forgiver, then you bear His name. You are a Christopher. Well, what does this look like? Well, we have this wonderful summary as we read from Colossians chapter 3. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. As we consider what it is to bear the name of Jesus, let me ask you three brief questions. The first one is, what are your words to God like? Remember Moses in Exodus 34, he he stands in awe of God. And yet here as well in Colossians 3, for these early Christians, there's there's an outpouring of celebration and and of gratitude, of of thankfulness, of praise, of song. Because they've they've dwelt on the name of Jesus. They've recognised His word and His truth. And they're thankful and they praise God. What are your words to God like? Secondly, what are your words about God like? How do we speak to others about God? Now, the Colossians here are teaching with God's wisdom. They're displaying His goodness. And I gather that's both to other believers, but also to the community around them. How do your words about God point to His grace and kindness? And thirdly, How are our lives lived out in His name? We read from the next verse. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Notice that our words and our deeds can be done in the name of Jesus. With both our words and our lives, Like Israel, we can lessen, we can empty the name. But with His help, and as Paul says to the Colossians, let Jesus rule in your hearts. Then actually with our words and with our deeds, we can lift up His name towards praise and glory and worship. Because we bear His name. And so we do it all in the name of Jesus. For we are all Christophers. We all bear the name of Jesus. 
Let me pray from 2 Thessalonians. As Paul prayed, may our God make us worthy of his calling and that by his power he may bring to fruition our every desire for goodness and our every deed prompted by faith. And we pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in us according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening. We trust today's message encouraged you as you follow Jesus. For more information about Emmanuel Church, please visit our website, glenhaven.church. Until next time, bye for now.